are we going to meet Timothy? That's what we're going to find out in Acts 16. Well, you know, the answer is yes, we are going to meet Timothy. So Paul went to Derby and Lystra, and there was Timothy, son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and his father was Greek. And by the other people in the church, they spoke well of him. Paul wanted Timothy to come with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in that place, and they knew his father was Greek. If your mother is Jewish, you are Jewish. That's why I'm Jewish. My mother was Jewish, but my father was not. And didn't we just get done with this? Didn't we just get done saying that you don't have to be circumcised? But why? Because he wanted to be able to have Timothy speak to Jewish people. And this would be a hurdle to them. And obviously, Timothy agreed to do this. And they went on their way. It says they even talked about the decisions reached by the apostles and elders. So they told him what happened. And Timothy's like, really, dude, after what you just did to me? I'm just kidding. Timothy was probably fine. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and increased in numbers. They went to an area called Phrygia and Galatia, so Galatians. We're going to talk about them and find out more about them later. But it says it was they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia Minor, not uh, what it would we consider Asia Minor in the Roman Empire was Turkey, modern day Turkey. We don't know why the Holy Spirit said no. What was the purpose in that? But what we do know is the new mission paid off. So again, we don't know, but we'll find out. So they ended up going to Troyes, which is, I think, fairly close to the ancient city of Troy. You know, when I was in college, they said Troy never happened. There was no Troy. It's all made up. Then they found Troy. Troyes is close to there. And someone said to Paul, you know, come over to Macedonia. We need your help. And so Paul saw a vision, and immediately we sought to go on our way to Macedonia, concluding that God called us to preach the gospel to them. I've heard a lot of missionaries talk about places that they thought they were going to go, and they ended up someplace else. Sometimes that just happens. It is in the, what do they call the Balkan area of Greece. So it's part of Greece. It was a Roman province. It was part of there. It's an old city. It was... They said that it was inhabited a thousand years before Christ was born. Macedonia means like highlands, highlanders. It's a region unto itself. And this particular area, Julius defeated Pompey there, and Anthony Octavian defeated Brutus and Cassius. So it's a, it's a famous place. I guess the reason I call out famous places is not because I think, you know, it matters that places are famous or not famous. But there's a general feel, I think, when you're not a Christian, that all this stuff is just made up. These are baloney places, or if, even if they're real places, there's not many people. There, there weren't many witnesses. You know, so it, it just dispenses the whole thing. When in fact, when we look at this, this is a major place, a major colony. So it, this is real, and this is a real major center. So they went out and went to Philippi which is going to be named for Philip, which is the father of Alexander the Great, which is one of the bigger cities in Macedonia. It says on Sabbath, they went outside the gate to the riverside, and it was going to be a place of prayer. They're going to go out there and pray. And they sat down and spoke to a woman. And one of the women was called Lydia. She was from a city called Thyatira. And she sold purple goods, which means she, you know, dyed fabrics. You know, so that would be like a a fabric worker. And purple, boy, you make purple, that is the color of kings. You know, that's probably the the hardest color to do. And that's why royal people wanted them. So she probably was doing pretty good for herself. But it says that she was a worshiper for God. She said that her heart was open to pay attention to the word said by Paul. And after that, she was baptized, her whole house as well. And she said, you know, if you think I'm faithful to the Lord, come to my house kind of fellowship that happens over meals, hospitality fellowship. So they're going to the place of prayer again, and a slave girl was there, and she had the spirit of divination, brought, you know, which was not good, probably. She's probably demon-possessed is the word here. And the owners were using her power to make money. But it's funny, I saw one of the most famous, uh, Jean Dixon, fortune tellers that was in all the newspapers and everything else like that. And you could tell it was baloney, I'm, I'm sorry to say. 
And I'm, well, I mean, we know it's baloney. And, but you still can make money. And there were so many people standing around me who believed it. I was like 11 and she was t- doing her thing in front of a stage and, and in an act. And I was like, but this isn't right. She's just saying things like, who in the crowd has a relative who's sick? Who in the crowd has a relative who's sick who's cancer? And then she'd go down the line and then five minutes later say, she'll be better. You know, and, and like, oh man, you know, she's giving these people hope without any reasons, I guess. And, you know, that doesn't matter whether this fortune telling was true, not true. She was making, they were making money off of her for being a fortune teller. And so then she followed Paul and cried out, these are the servants of the most high God who have proclaimed the way salvation. She kept doing this, they said, for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned to her and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, the spirit, to come out of her. And at that very hour, it came out of her. But when the owners saw that their money bags were going to go away now that their fortune teller is uh, no longer possessed by whatever was possessing her, they had Paul and Silas dragged into the market before the rulers of the area and the magistrates, the legal people, and says, these are men who are Jews, but they're disturbing our city. Now, it was said that there was a very strong anti-Jewish feeling in this town. You know, anti-Semitism has been around a really long time. And by saying that, they said their customs are not lawful for us. We're Romans. And so the crowd started attacking them. And the magistrate tore their garments and gave them orders to beat them with rods. After having inflicted many blows, it says that they threw him into prison and ordered the jailer to keep him safely there. And when the jailer heard this, they put him into the inner prison, which is going to have like more sets of doors. And their feet were in stocks, which means chains. So they were chained to that. So the midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly it says there was a great earthquake. The foundations shook to the whole prison building. And suddenly all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were no longer attached to them. The jailer wakes up and sees that the doors are open. He was going to kill himself because we already learned that if you are a jailer, if you are to guard prisoners and your prisoners escape, you're dead. You're going to be killed. So you might as well do it yourself in a more humane or quicker way than what the Romans are going to do to you. And Paul cries out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, which I first thought, oh, he turned on the lights. But instead, he probably lit some torches and or some oil lanterns. And they trembled in fear and fell down before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, sir, what must I do to be saved? And they told me, you have to believe in Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household all believe, you know, you're going to believe in Lord Jesus. Um, I used to work for InterVarsity and someone asked this question about when a group of people or like a tribe leader says, we're going to believe in Jesus Christ, and then, you know, everyone's saved, they say, or the family is saved. It is because the family did whatever the head of the family ordered to, to, be, to, to be done. Do you say, I believe? I'm going to believe it. And it, everyone has the same way to Jesus. But by the fact that the jailer is going to tell his family you're going to believe this, they're all going to believe it. Same thing with like a tribal situation as well. And they spoke the word of the Lord and everyone in the house That same night, it says, they washed their wounds, and he baptized the jailer and all of his family. So then they brought him up to the house, gave him food, and rejoiced. This was a happy thing. This guy was about to kill himself, leave his family destitute, you know, with nothing, because the wife can't own any property or anything like that. And now he's rejoicing. Moments later, we can do the thing we want to do, which for Paul and Silas would be leave immediately. but. In this case, God wanted this situation to bring that jailer and his family to faith. And that's what happened. So then when the magistrate sends the police, it says police, that's kind of funny. NIV calls them officers. We get the idea and said, let these men go. And so the jailer reported the words of Paul, what Paul said, and told him that the magistrate said to let you go. So they come out now and you can go peace. You're good to go. But Paul said, you know, they, they beat us in the public uncondemned men. We know we didn't do anything. And I am a Roman citizen. So is Silas. We're Roman citizens. You can't just throw us in prison secretly. We're supposed to have trials. 
you know, there's rules you had for Roman citizens. So no, we're not going to take ourselves out. They can come in here and get us. So basically, the idea here is that the magistrates ordered them released because them being brutally beaten, you being in that horrible prison for a night, that that was the punishment. We're going to show everyone that we punished you appropriately. And by saying we're Roman citizens and you did these things to us, the magistrates could have been in trouble. I mean, say what you will about how awful Rome was and how brutal Rome was. They had laws and the laws were followed. And so even though the magistrates were important and Paul and Silas were unimportant, they still had rights and they demanded them. And so commentators believe that that was why they were being let go, because it was illegal to do to them. Not that they were trying to be nice and say, okay, fine, you got your punishment. You can go now. You, everyone knows what happened to you. It's fine. You took your punishment. But instead, saying they were afraid for their own lives because they let something unlawful happen. And so the police came back and told the magistrates, and it says, and this is how we know, the magistrates were afraid when they found out that these two men were Roman citizens. So they apologized, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. And so they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when she saw that they were okay, she was encouraged, right? And that ends chapter 16. What I'm going to meditate on this week is when people hear the Word of God and all these different backgrounds, right? The jailer, the People in Macedonia, the Lydia who dyed purple uh, cloth, it changes people's hearts. And you might say, oh, Lydia sounds like a stand up person. She was probably a stand up person before this happened. But instead, you see how much people are excited to receive the word of God. Lydia, the jailer, them to his family, meeting people and hearing about the word of God is life changing. And what I'm going to pray about is that boldness. If I got arrested, if these things happened to me, boy, I would make a beeline out the door. But to have that boldness that Paul and Silas had, that's really amazing. They kept going and look at the, the fruits of it. Look at the people they brought to them and look at how they treated their time in prison. Look at the time that they could have escaped and they didn't. That is true bravery and perseverance in the word. And what I'm going to share with others is that life changing message of Jesus. How people are one way in one moment, and then they hear the word of God and their whole life changes. My whole life changed. You can't underestimate the power of God in people's lives. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please subscribe, listen to the podcast, and tell a friend. I would love to get more people listening to the podcast. Boy, I would love to have a community going. We have some time because we're going to go through this Bible in small steps, three chapters a week, it's going to be a while. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a community of discussions and all that type stuff? All right, everyone. Thanks so much.